the services that were presented uh, well to you would always work as documented, as expected, as everything, and that's well. Those services were just like uh, bricks that you could use safely to build complex systems, and that's what happens. Uh, that was ha that's what happens on well most of the projects that actually ship uh, nowadays. Uh, at Capgemini, we are mostly uh, integrators, so we just take customers' needs as uh, as inputs, and we just ship. Uh, well, we sh we just ship solutions uh, solutions made of uh, made of like loads of bricks communicated communicating with each other, and we try to make that well to make everything work together as expected. But the thing is, the more complex the systems are, and uh, well the more risk you have to actually have something that breaks in the end that, that can just take, the, take your whole system down. Uh, and that's, well, what you have to plan and what you have to fight for when you just, uh, when you just start to design uh, systems that are built on top of loads of services, loads of APIs, even when you just, uh, when you just go contract, well, your project to be hosted on uh, on some private cloud somewhere, uh, and well, as long as you just lose control over part of your system or your infrastructure, you have to make sure that uh, you can just uh, that you can just well survive if the blocks you're building on top of uh, sometimes fail. So that's basically you when. Uh, that's basically the well. That's the basic customer uh, well, on day one when we just go meet a customer and just pitch the customer on what we are going to do. And uh, when we try to talk about the risks that it, that the customer is taking uh, when he contracts with some well cloud hosting provider, some uh, web API provider, we are just well telling him, well, you know, you have to plan. In case some failure is going to happen, you just have to make sure everything's going to be okay. And usually, customers' answer is, "Well, that it's not going to happen. You know, I'm just building on top of whatever comes out of Google, Amazon, whatever, and it's just not going to happen." Actually, sometimes it happens. You know, when you when you just contract with those providers, you have SLAs telling you that uh, the service will work as expected 99 point something percent of the time. Uh, but well, sometimes it just fails. That's the zero point something percent of other times. And you really have to make sure that it's not going to turn everything down for you. And that's not going to harm your business. So well, it happens. It happened this year for EC2, and uh, that brought, uh, that put down well, Instagram, uh, lots of stuff, lots of services down for several hours. So there were SLAs. Those SLAs were not met, and some businesses fell down for a few hours, few days, whichever. And that's well, when we talk about that to our customers, that's the face they make. From there to there, so um, so well. The thing is, actually, uh, all systems built by humans fail. When we talk about uh, when we talk about web services, uh, web hosting, web whatever, uh, or anyway, systems based on uh, on, com on computers, we at least we have SLAs. We just talk about failure, and we try to just size the amount of failure that we put on top of the systems. That's not the case in every, well, in other systems. If you take planes, for example, well, I'm pretty sure if you, if I just told you like, okay, just if I sell you a plane ticket and I tell you there's one person chance that the flight's never gonna arrive at its destination and it will crash uh, inevitably, uh, then well, I'm pretty sure you wouldn't just actually buy the ticket. Uh, plane aircraft makers wouldn't sell planes that way uh, by just saying that, uh, that it may fail sometime. But it, well, planes actually fail 
power plants actually fail. People die from it. Uh, crises are raised from it. And websites fail, especially when they are built on top of complex APIs, complex systems. And well, when it fails, well, basically, as end user, it's not a big deal. You just have to go out and do something else. But as a business, uh, as business, you can lose money because, well, just let's say, for instance, you're actually, well, you're selling stuff, uh, you're selling stuff through your web app or through your website. Uh, if the site goes down for some reason, uh, you lose customers. If you lose customers, even momentarily, you lose money. Uh, you also lose brand trust because, well, basically, if your website is done, then uh, then your customers just start to worry about what you what you can actually deliver. And uh, if you cannot deliver something as simple as a, as a website that works uh, for buying stuff online, for providing services online, then people start to just believe that you cannot deliver anything at all. And well. If you lose brand trust, you also lose money eventually because you, when you lose brand trust, you lose customers. Uh, customers who trust your brand just recommend. They recommend your brand. They come back often. They buy more stuff. Uh, well, basically, if you uh, lose availability, if the service you, pro you provide online gets down or gets well, gets kind of funky with loads of. Uh, error messages or whatever you want, um, well, you just potentially lose money and you will lose money over time from the blunder that you, uh, that you just suffered from. So uh, failures happen, uh, not so often, but they happen sometimes. Uh, when you build your system on top of, uh, on, on top of a lot of components, uh, like we've been talking about, this morning and we'll talk about later today and tomorrow. Uh, when you build on top of everything like that, it happens and can happen, uh, well, not that often, but it happens sometimes. And you really have to uh, protect your system so, uh, so your system doesn't go down every time something under goes down. So, well, there are a few tips and tricks to uh, to to just well, to just protect your system uh, from everything like that. Uh, there are a lot of technical tricks actually, but uh, we are not here to talk about the technical details right now. Uh, we are more going to talk about uh, how to plan, uh, how to plan your project, how to m how you should manage your project to prevent such blunders to happen. So well. The first tip, and I'm a developer, so uh, so that's quite shocking. If I were you, if I were in the audience, I would be like, okay, uh, this guy's a jerk and everything, everything, everything. But well, just don't trust your developers too much. It's not like, okay, developers uh, are not bad persons or lazy persons, but they are just people who, who can actually understand what's going wrong on a website. and. Uh, or on any project, and since they can just uh, understand what's going wrong, they just minimize the consequences of what's happening. So basically, uh, most of the developers, when they see a web page that's not looking right with tons of errors, but well, as long as they see something, they're like, okay, it's just no big deal, you know. Uh, yeah, you can see tons of error messages, but I can explain each of them, and none of them is, well, so wrong. So we just don't worry about it and let it flow. Well, on the other side, if my mom comes to the same website with the same errors, she won't understand anything, and she will panic and close her browser window, close her computer, and just go do something else because she gets panicked. She would get panicked from it. So don't trust your developers too much because uh, they understand things that normal people don't understand. And also because they are under quite a high amount of pressure, usually, uh, well, handling systems that fail take time. Uh, that takes time, and developers are usually out of time because they are the, 
well, they, they, are, they are the end, well, they are the end of the chain of decision. They are the ones who are actually executing, uh, well, taking actions uh, when others decide and others control. Uh, so, well, those people are under constant pressure and they just try to uh, deliver what they can deliver in, well, the shortest time they can. And that leads to just systems that are not always fully optimized, fully protected. And well, as I was telling you, I used to be a developer, I still am, kind of. And well, you really wouldn't believe what I've done in the past. Uh, just because I was out of time, uh, well, I shipped complete SDK with no, well, with no layer of error management. That went live on humanoid robots and financial websites and everything. And well, that just went online like that without anybody just trying to uh, well, without anybody just trying to audit what was happening or just even nobody caring about that. And well, that was really like, that's really something you shouldn't do. So when you manage developers, you should really make sure that uh, those developers provide clean documented code that uh, just go, uh, go along with the, that follow the best practices in their areas that are fully tested. So unit testing is very important. And you really need to have a QA team every time that tests every piece of code. And that's very like, that's really testing like my mom would test. And that's really tedious about, um, about raising all the alerts, all the warnings that, uh, that well, even something in insignificant because uh, that may be what, uh, well, that may be what may explode at your face when something's really gonna fail and, well, your developers won't have planned it. As a project manager, you also need to uh, plan how to fail early enough. Uh, so, well, developers uh, are under pressure of project managers and customers and whatever you want. Everybody on top of them. Uh, why they are? Because most of the time, um, most of the time, everything related to error management, failure management, uh, well, basically what to do when a system fails and how to degrade gracefully is not taken care of early enough. What you do usually is that you design a system you build a system, uh, you test a little bit, see if, well, if it complies to, uh, to the guidelines you put at first, uh, in the first place. And well, if you have time, usually you start, if you have time at the end of the project, which basically never happens, uh, you just try to take your team and ask them to optimize the performance a little bit. And if you have extra time, you just, start to ask your team to make sure that everything works gracefully when you just, uh, okay, when this API goes down or this uh, API one goes down, API two goes down. Uh, and well, if you have time to do all that, you deliver something that's barely acceptable and that goes online, that goes live and well, that barely works. What you should really do is that you should include all performance, but also failure recovery uh, topics on the design phase. You really need to, uh, to include that well, at design time because, well, failure management is not something that's only code related. It's not implementation related. It's also mostly uh, related to user experience. It's related to how you actually design your workflow. Well, let's say you're just uh, designing an e-commerce website, uh, you design your checking out, checkout workflow uh, on the design phase. And if something goes wrong uh, during this checkout, uh, if you rely on APIs or, which, or whichever to uh, compute, I don't know, to compute uh, delivery time, to compute uh, delivery fees or whichever, well, that's clearly included in your checkout workflow and if there's any failure at this point, then you should 
you should really include the use case that go along with this on the design phase. It's not a code related issue. So you really have to plan uh, failure management. It's not like some patch you can apply at the end. It's really something you have to think about at the beginning uh, of your project planning and project design or anything. Uh, and that may save your life in the end. And well, when you go live, after, you, after you've done that, when you go live, you're really, li you're really sure that you're resilient, that you comply fully to the, to, the to the expectations that your customer had in the first place. And usually the projects that are managed that way by experience, well, when the projects go live in the end, the project, the project manager is really like not even crossing his fingers or anything. He actually knows that things are going to be OK no matter what. So one thing you shouldn't hesitate to do also, I, I, I just say that most of it, at least a big part of it, is user experience related. And user experience is all about finding some elegant ways to just, uh, well, to just show the, rea the reality, the way you want to, well, the way you want to turn it. So here's an example of a banking website that's a bank from, kind of big bank from Singapore. Um, and well, at some point, they had some uh, three, four hours hangover time uh, a few months ago. And when you just wanted to make a transfer from your account to another, it just <coughs> showed some nice form. Uh, asking you to input the amount, the, to input uh, whatever, well, the, um, the bank account number of the people, of the person you wanted to, uh, to give money to. Uh, well, just the, basic, just the basic thing you would, uh, you would expect from such a website. And well, when you were actually validating the transaction, you had that, error 500, uh, internal server error. That's something that would make, since it's on a banking website, since it's dealing with your money, since it's dealing with, well, things that are supposed not to fail, uh, and, well, it's dealing with your money, with your privacy, with everything you want. Uh, when you see that, usually, uh, even as an expert, even as a developer, you're just like, okay, what actually happened to my money? What's happening behind? What my mother would say is like, okay, oh my God, someone from Iran just tried to hack my account. Now they, are, they know my address. They know who I am. They just, they're just going to knock at my door and, well, try to do something nasty to me. Actually, just what happened is just that the web front end lost the connection to the, to the banking back end that just performed financial transactions. So. Uh, they had this. It was not handled the right way, but uh, they just had this. It was completely harmless. The transaction was logged uh, at the front end level, but it was just not sent to the to the back end level. And well, the transaction was cancelled uh, automatically. But well, you had just no visual feedback of uh, what was happening behind the scenes. So what they should have done is just write something like, okay. Uh, we are not able to, uh, for some reason, which is, well, for some reason that we don't want to tell you about, so we tell something very like reassuring to you. Uh, we tell you something that's not going to make you flip over. Uh, since we are not able to perform your transaction right now, we are just logging it. We are just logging the transaction and we are sending it to your banker and your banker is going to contact you if there's an issue, uh, ta 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 ta. Something that even my mom would understand. If they had done that instead of just error 500, uh, well, then clearly, if you're someone with, even someone with no knowledge of whatever technical, uh, well, that would give you the impression that everything is under control, so you wouldn't worry. Uh, you wouldn't just uh, call, the, call the whatever call center that your bank offers you to just, uh, to just complain, 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 make sure that uh, your money is safe and everything, because that's usually what happens when you see that, just call centers are overflowing with requests. And since you make a reference with your physical person, you're just um, 
so your local bank manager, um, you just create some, uh, well, it's just the beginning of some crisis, reaction to crisis, uh, well, kind of dispatch, uh, where every customer is going to, uh, well, every customer is not going to rush to the main call center, but they're going to rush to, uh, well, different people, their local customers. So nobody's really going to be, uh, there's, there's really not going to be some overflow of requests. It's, and well, the crisis is going to be handled pretty much the right way. So, well, just by ch changing the wording, just by making some fancier, uh, error 500 page, you can, just, uh, you can just mitigate some kinds of crisis. If you go one bit further, uh, if you go one bit further, you can just, uh, to complete this, uh, this example, uh, if you just change the message and nothing happens behind, then, uh, well, two days later, uh, when the crisis is over, the customers are going to just log again on their banking interfaces and they're going to see that nothing happened and that their transactions were not, uh, well, that their, their, their bank transfers were not taken into account of. And that's when they're going to complain again and that's when your call centers are going to be overflowing again, extra, extra, extra. So just by changing uh, the error message, you don't do everything, obviously, or else, uh, or else, well, developers wouldn't be that useful. So you just have to, um, you just have to build like airbag solutions when things go wrong, and that's what's more funny. You just have to, uh, at the design phase, you really have to build your workflows in a way that's, well, whatever service is failing, you have just some plan B, some kind of exit runway to, uh, to actually direct your flow and to actually uh, recover your data even if you uh, work in a degraded way. So in that case, uh, so the error message is not a bad thing uh, from a well, user perspective and user perspective, but you also have, uh, well, when a transaction, when you push the validate button, you have to log the transaction somewhere. And if you can, if your, if your infrastructure is not hurt too much, you also have to just redirect, redispatch the information uh, to the right instances so uh, everything can be handled offline without the user uh, without the end user knowing that something went wrong uh, on the application. So if you do that, you really have, well, you keep the customer satisfaction. If you do that, uh, you also just uh, avoid any kind of overflow. You avoid, uh, well, you avoid any internal crisis, uh, uh, well, in your bank or anything. Uh, and well, everything, operations just run much more smoothly. Um, another example, which is well, one that we had to uh, one that we had to handle uh, for the Belgian Post uh, a few months ago at Capgemini. Uh, well, that's not the Belgian Post on the screen cap, but uh, the project is not completely done yet, so uh, so we don't have screens yet. But well, basically they were building uh, they were building a new platform with well. A uh, new e-commerce platform with a uh, checkout workflow that included um, that included uh, well de delivery time picking. So it looked like that you could pick uh, you could pick an available spot and you could get your items delivered to your door. Uh, well, for example, between two p.m. and uh, between two p.m. and three p.m. on a Tuesday. Okay, so you can ju you could just at Checkout time, you could just uh, decide when you wanted your items shipped, how you wanted your items, chi items shipped, and that all went through a web API uh, that happened to have a pretty low availability. Actually, it was like 97% uh, availability guaranteed. Uh, so they really wanted failover, uh, 
failure of resilience on top of that. And that's how they called us to just, uh, to just envision failure of scenarios. And that's what we did. And actually, uh, even when there's uh, in the well end solution, even when uh, the the API is not available, the API behind that is not available, you still see that the very same screen with well the very same whatever you want avail available spot, not available spot, opened closed spot. Uh, except that uh, what we are using basically is when we can use caching, API caching, uh, that's what we just do. And well, basically, uh, if we assume that if the service behind goes down, uh, it won't go down for days. It will go down probably for 15, 20, 30 minutes max. And the available time slots during that time, the available time slots won't change so much. So we just take the bet that if we cache on a pretty regular basis um, those information, they will stay accurate even if the system goes down sometimes. So that's what we do. Uh, the only problem is that uh, this is uh, location dependent. So, well, if there's no cached data in the area that, uh, that the customer is trying to get delivered in, then what we have to do, what we do actually, is we still show the screen, uh, but we just go for statistics that we could grab from previous transactions, previous, well, all the analytics we could get from before. Uh, we push that in and we try to figure out how to smartly fill out this form. Uh, to just provide something that looks like it works and so that we don't block the workflow, uh, the checkout workflow. So what's happening is that the information we, we, we display in that case uh, may, happen to be, uh, may happen to be inaccurate. So let's say you pick the 6 to 7 uh, p.m. slot here. Well, it appeared on the screen that, okay, it was available and uh, you could pick it, but maybe when the service goes back up, uh, the system will realize that uh, this time slot was not even available. So uh, what we do in that case is that just at the next step when the, when the service was not available, at the next step, we just provide a short, and in the email confirmation, we just pr provide, we just come up with a small message saying, uh, Okay, we are trying to uh, we are trying to schedule you at that time in that spot, uh, but you may be uh, you may be contacted by one of our operators to uh, well if this slot appears not to be available in anymore when we just process your order. So still the same kind of nice secure like error message um, that just doesn't block the checkout workflow uh, that takes your uh, preference into account, uh, but still that just, uh, well, that just, as an as a end user, as a customer, you don't even see something's going wrong behind. Uh, Everything is handled smoothly. The only thing is that uh, you may be contacted by, uh, by a phone operator at some point to just uh, change your delivery date, well, when you get when, you, when the system gets additional information about that when the service goes back up. So, well, there are tons of other ideas, uh, most of them being UX related, uh, but well, we could talk about that all day. Uh, I don't think we have time for that. So, well, the whole thing you have to remember is that if you plan early enough and if you're smart enough and creative enough to just, um, well, to just deal with any, well, any workflow, any, well, any complicated case that can happen to you in terms of, well, and deal with them with just good sense, uh, with a good dose of uh, user experience management, and, well, if you know how to write smart error message and everything, well, you can, with a tight budget even, you can just come up with solutions that 
fail quite often, but uh, that won't fail, uh, with, that won't take your whole business down, that won't make you lose money, that won't make you lose, uh, that won't make you lose brand trust, uh, and well, in the end that will just go and just flow and won't even be, won't even be identified by end users. So, well, you, if you have any questions about that, if you, well, want to talk a bit more deeply uh, right now, after any time, uh, just feel free to raise your hand or just come talk to me in private if you want. Yeah. Just a question. What, what does Capgemini do about APIs in general? I mean, are you just a user? Do you create technology? Or well, basically, we have uh, an innovation lab that actually creates APIs, uh, open sources APIs, sometimes, not always. Uh, but what we do is we are pretty much a system integrator. So we, we just take APIs from everywhere and we just assemble them, just build solutions uh, on top of those APIs and plus, well, custom code plus UX design plus whatever you want. And we just, uh, we just deliver the, sol the, the end solution to, uh, to our customer and we maintain that end solution. So what we also do is we also provide a kind of, uh, well, we just provide kind of uh, quality, ins quality assurance and uh, we provide a kind of uh, support contracts on top of uh, APIs, even some open source APIs uh, that are flowing around and that are not edited or supported by, uh, by some, well, identified commercial actor in the community. So we just take, uh, we, we just take those solutions and we sell well, we don't sell those solutions because they're open source, obviously, but we sell uh, support contracts uh, to, well, big accounts, uh, big companies. Uh, so, well, we just bring the flexibility and power of those solutions, but at the same time, uh, we just build additional, we just bring additional trust uh, to the big companies that really cannot see those solutions failing with nobody to, uh, to turn to.